Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about some important results in linear algebra. Indeed, in today's part 48, we will continue our discussion about the Spectral Theorem. And you will see that we already have all the tools we need to formulate the proof of it. However, as always, before we start with the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, if you want to download the additional material, you can find everything with the link in the description. Okay, then without further ado, let's start and recall the spectral theorem for normal matrices. So please note, the matrices we consider here are complex-valued and square matrices. And moreover, the attribute normal now means that the adjoint of A commutes with A. And now the spectral theorem tells us that being normal is equivalent to A being unitarily diagonalizable. Which means we can transform A into a diagonal matrix just by using a unitary matrix. So more precisely, our unitary is a square matrix U and then we get that u star a u is a diagonal matrix. So as already mentioned in the last video, this is the best case we can have in the sure normal form. And in fact, this sure decomposition we will use in the proof of the spectral theorem. However, let's first formulate the simpler direction, which means we go from the right to the left. Hence, we already assume that we can find such a unitary to transform A into diagonal form. And maybe here we can already write D for our diagonal matrix. And then what we immediately get is that this diagonal matrix is clearly a normal matrix as well. There's not much to show because D star is a diagonal matrix and also D star D. So everything is happening on the diagonal and the result is the same as d, d star. So you can just remember, diagonal matrices always commute simply because we only have to deal with the complex numbers on the diagonal. And of course we have the commutative property for the complex numbers as a number field. And now we will see that this translates immediately to our matrix A because we have this relation. For that, let's simply calculate a star a and also a a star. So you see, the only thing we have to do here is to bring u star and u to the right hand side. Hence, our matrix A is just given as u d u star. And in addition to that, you just need to know that the star changes the order in the matrix product and also that u star star is u again. In other words, this first part is simply u times d star times u star times u d u star. And this is very good because now in the middle we just find the identity matrix simply because u is a unitary matrix. Hence what remains is just u d star d u star. And now it might not surprise you that we can do a similar calculation for the other order. Obviously not much changes here, now we have the star calculation on the right hand side. This means we also find our d star on the right hand side, but still in the middle we find u star u. This is the identity matrix, so it vanishes in the middle and what remains is u d d star times u star. And now since we know that the middle part is the same thing, we know that we have the equality here as well. So that's it, this closes our equality and we know that the matrix A has to be a normal matrix. Therefore our first implication of the equivalence is already shown and we can go to the next one. And in fact for this one we will need the sure decomposition for the matrix A. So now the premise is that we have a square matrix A which is also normal. However here having a square matrix already guarantees that the sure decomposition exists. This is what we have done in part 45 and it tells us that we can transform our matrix A into an upper triangular matrix. And most importantly, this is possible by just using a unitary matrix U. So the first thing we get here is that U star A is equal to an upper triangular matrix we can call R. So you see, the sure decomposition does not tell us that we get a diagonal matrix, 
but it could be one. And indeed, this is what we have to show now. In the case that A is normal, this upper triangular matrix is in fact a diagonal matrix. So maybe the first observation is, in the case A is normal, then this upper triangular matrix R also has to be a normal matrix. To see that, we can just calculate R star R and on the other hand R R star. And if we get the same result, we know that R is also a normal matrix. In fact, this is really similar to before, because we just have to use the star operation in the matrix product. In other words, we will find the identity matrix in the middle again, so it will just vanish. So what remains is simply A star A. And not so surprising, we can do the same calculation for R R star, and we also get the identity matrix in the middle. And in this case, what remains in the middle is just A A star. And there you see, since A is a normal matrix, we have equality here as well. So our triangular matrix R is a normal matrix, and our whole discussion is now reduced to normal triangular matrices. So the overall question is simply, how do normal triangular matrices look like? Indeed, what we want is that if they are normal in that sense, then we already have a diagonal matrix. And in order to answer our question, we can first look at a simple case. So let's say we look at the general 2 times 2 case. This means our upper triangular matrix R can be represented by three complex numbers. And to keep it simple, let's call them A, B and C. And then the first step here is to calculate the adjoint of R. So first we can use the transpose and then the complex conjugation on every entry. So you could say R star is a lower triangular matrix. Okay, and now we can just use the fact that R should be a normal triangular matrix which means these two calculations give the same results. Maybe let's start with R R star, because it's the same order as we have written it here. And there you might see, the first entry is A times A bar plus B times B bar. So it's the absolute value A squared plus the absolute value B squared. And in fact, this is already enough information we need. I will not calculate the other entries, because not so complicated and we don't need them. Of course, as an exercise you can do that, but I will immediately go to our next calculation. So what we want is exactly the first entry for R star R. Which means we combine this column together with this row, and there you see, no B is involved. So what we get out is just the absolute value of A squared. Therefore, there are only non-negative numbers involved, and the only possibility to get the equality here is that this entry is equal to zero. So we can immediately conclude that the entry B has to be zero. Which gives us the conclusion that R actually is a diagonal matrix all along. So you see, the spectral theorem for two times two matrices is already proven. In the two times two case, we have that normal triangular matrices are necessarily diagonal. And at this point in the linear algebra course, it might not surprise you that we can get the general result simply by an induction. And as you know, induction always works in the following way. We assume that the statement is correct for the case n, and then we prove it for n plus 1. So the induction hypothesis is that an n times n upper triangular matrix, which is also normal, is necessarily diagonal. And in the induction step, we will consider matrices of the size n plus 1 times n plus 1. And in fact, the whole idea of the induction step we have already seen in the 2 times 2 case, where we reduce the whole matrix just to the first component. And this is what we will do again for our case in the dimension n plus 1. This means we call the first entry a again, and we also already know that below this number a, we only find zeros in the whole column. Therefore we can make everything simpler and write R as a block matrix. Which means we have a new matrix R tilde here in the bottom corner. And obviously it also has to be an upper triangular matrix. However above this R tilde we find a whole row of numbers and I call this one W star. So this makes sense, because W star is a row vector with n entries, so a row vector in Cn. This means 
the adjoint of w star is a column vector in Cn. So the notation with the star fits in because the column vector we can just call w. Indeed this whole naming situation is quite nice because we also have to calculate r star. So the adjoint of r obviously transposes everything. Which means we have the complex conjugate of a in the first entry and the adjoint of r tilde in the lower corner. On the other hand our row vector becomes a column vector and this is our w here in the bottom left corner. And now since we know that r should be a normal matrix we can just calculate the two orders which are equal. So maybe as before let's start on the left hand side with r r star. So there we combine this column with that row. And obviously what we get is the absolute value of a squared plus w star w. So we know this combination of a row vector with a column vector gives us a scalar and actually this is the inner product of w with w. It's the standard inner product so we get out the standard Euclidean norm of w squared. So most importantly this one is a non-negative number again. And moreover in the whole matrix product here we will ignore the two other entries here but we will calculate the other corner. And this one is just r tilde times r tilde star. So in that sense we have a nice block matrix again. Okay and now we will do the same calculation with the other order and there you should see we combine this column with this row. In other words the first entry we get here is just the absolute value of a squared. And since both sides should be the same again the only conclusion is that our w vector is equal to the zero vector. And with that we almost have the diagonal structure again we just have to know what happens with r tilde. However if you look at the right bottom corner here you see that r tilde is also a normal matrix. So there we have it. The implication is that w is equal to the zero vector and r tilde is a normal matrix as well. And since r tilde is also an upper triangular matrix we can use our induction hypothesis. Which means the only possibility we have is that r tilde is already a diagonal matrix. And now these two results together imply that our original matrix r has to be a diagonal matrix as well. So the whole proof by induction is done. So indeed this is a general result you can remember. Every upper triangular matrix which is also normal has to be a diagonal matrix. Hence the sure normal form of a normal matrix has to be a diagonal matrix and this finishes our proof. So the spectral theorem is proven. Now we know that normal matrices are exactly the matrices that are unitarily diagonalizable. And as already mentioned the most important special case of such normal matrices are self-adjoint matrices. So the spectral theorem tells us that self-adjoint matrices are unitarily diagonalizable. Which means you can always find an O and B consisting of eigenvectors for a self-adjoint matrix. This is the most important diagonalization we have and something we will discuss in another video. So really hope I meet you there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.